Tell me, have you heard what they say about this place? About it being haunted? Well, I'm here to tell you it's true. And that solution wasn't found in a medical transcript or an autopsy report, but from their graves. They'll go into the back parking lot, look up, and see a light on in this bedroom. But here's the problem. There's no electricity in the room. It just can't be. The red-headed hitchhiker will begin to giggle. That giggle will soon turn into maniacal laughter, piercing the ears of everyone in the car until they just can't take it anymore. Alfred said as he slowed down and turned to look at the man, he said, well, he'd regretted it. And to this day, he'll never forget those deep, dark, staring eyes that met his gaze as his car slowly passed by the Grange Hall. So the whole idea behind this stage show really was born a couple of years ago. And it happened because I met Frank Grace, the photographer. He, he does such amazing photos. Frank can tell a ghost story with a single picture. And he has this ability to look at something. You know, I, I can't take a picture to save my life. And he doesn't even take pictures. He takes photographs. He takes works of art. And then he puts in the work to make them even more fantastic after that. And it draws you in. It captivates you. It makes things eerie. I've joked that this guy could make a McDonald's look scary. What I try to do is capture what it feels like to be there, to be there, to be inside the legend, inside the ghost story. He's incredible. He's so talented. And so when I started seeing his photographs, and I said, man, we got to do something with this. And I know some really talented storytellers. I knew I wanted Andrew Lake. He's got an amazing voice. He's a great storyteller. I knew I wanted Carl Johnson because I've seen him speak and he's got such a, again, a great voice and a, and a great way of telling stories. And Tim Weisberg, because he brings a lot of personality uh, and storytelling ability too. And, and of course his radio show, these guys are all experienced speakers, orators, and I knew they could do it. And I called each one of them and I said, this is what I want to do. This is the idea. Will you do this with me? And I was very humbled and flattered that every one of them, they didn't just say, yeah, okay. They said, hell yes, let's do this. Good evening. Good evening. Glad to see you all can make it. Please make yourselves comfortable. Tell me, have you heard what they say about this old place? About it being haunted? Well, I'm here to tell you it's true. It's all true. But that shouldn't surprise us for, after all, we live here in New England and New England is full of tales and ghost stories. For whatever reasons, there just seems to be a lot of superstition and a lot of the supernatural based in New England. Not only does it have a long human history, but it has a long, hard, violent, bloody human history. And also too, the climate can't be understated. We have some pretty harsh winters sometimes. And when it snows and when you're locked inside and there's nothing to do but sit by the fire, you share these stories. As much as there's the thrill of experiencing a ghost or experiencing a ghost story, you also get that thrill of telling it and sharing it and seeing the look on someone's face when you send that chill down their spine. Good evening. Welcome to North Adams, Massachusetts. Welcome to the Houghton Mansion. A.C. Houghton was a captain of industry. He was a big fish in the small pond, also the first mayor of North Adams. He built this mansion as a testament to his wealth, his prestige, his position in society, and it was here that he was happiest with his family. The tragedy struck in 1914. 
You see, Houghton had just purchased a brand new Pierce Arrow automobile. And his chauffeur, John Witters, had only driven horse and buggies before that. So this was new to him. On the morning of August 1st, 1914, Houghton decides he's going to take a trip up to Vermont. With Witters at the wheel and his daughter Mary in the car and his family friends, Dr. and Mrs. Hutton, they all jumped in and went north. In the town of Pownall, Vermont, which is just about 10 miles north of North Adams, they started to climb Oak Hill Road. Witters sees some construction on the right side of the road, so he pulls the car to the left, and as he does, the two tires hit a soft shoulder, sending the car rolling down the hill until it looked like this. Mrs. Hutton was killed instantly when she was crushed. The men were thrown from the car and only sustained minor injuries. And Mary Houghton, she was horribly mangled. They pulled her body from the wreckage and they got her to a nearby hospital where she died just a few hours later. As you can imagine, everyone was distraught. Probably none more than Witters himself. He felt responsible for this. Even though he was immediately cleared of any wrongdoing, he felt like he was responsible for this accident. All night, a friend sat with him at the Houghton Mansion on a suicide watch. But the next morning around 5 a.m., he said, I think I'll be okay, I'm just gonna go feed the horses. And as he goes back out to the horse barn, he takes a pistol and shoots himself. Can you imagine how A.C. Houghton must have felt at this point? Family friend dead. Uh, Witters was more than just a servant and a chauffeur. He was considered family as well. He lived with them and his precious daughter Mary, all dead within 24 hours. Just nine days later, Houghton himself died. They say of a broken heart. Now skeptics are quick to point out that he probably suffered some internal injuries. I don't know. Maybe they're both right. About 10 years later, the Houghton family sold the mansion to the Freemasons, who added on a Masonic temple, which only adds a layer of mystery and intrigue to this story. The Masons immediately knew this place was haunted. Now, if we go upstairs to Mary's room, this is a bedroom that we still think is haunted by Mary herself. There's this one particular chair where they say if you sit in it, you'll feel yourself pushed out of it by unseen hands. It seems Mary doesn't like visitors. But as we head down to the basement, by far the creepiest part of this entire building, we see relics of a bygone era, rust and decay, which stands in stark contrast to the spirit of a little girl that they say haunts this place. Now the strange thing is, we know it's not Mary Houghton because she was an adult when she died, and we're not aware of any other children who died in the house. But the Masons will walk down the hallway and feel a child, a child's hand grab theirs. And they're so sure it's a child, they've left toys out for her to play with. And these toys move. Sometimes a pinwheel will spin on its own, or a ball will roll by, or the toys are, are displaced in some way. Heading back up to the third floor, where John Witters is said to still haunt his old room, maybe he still feels distraught over what happened, and he's cursed to stay here forever. Or maybe he was sweet on young Mary, and is still looking after her spirit all these years later. We don't know, but what we do know is that when the Masons close up at night, they'll go into the back parking lot, look up, and see a light on in this bedroom. But here's the problem. There's no electricity in the room. It just can't be. Yet neighbors report it, the Masons report it again and again. And as we head back down to the library, where A.C. Houghton himself is said to still haunt this building, I can connect with him. I can imagine what he went through. I too have a family. I also have a daughter. I can't imagine what he went through. And if what happened to him happened to me, it would haunt me too. I do believe in ghosts, and I believe in them because I've had experiences I can't explain with any other word other than ghost. But even before that happened, I believed in them because so many people I'd talked to had an experience they couldn't explain. I think I believe in them because I want there to be ghosts. I want there to be something more, and I want there to be that connection. Uh, but at the same time, I also want an explanation for all the weird things that have happened to me in my life. I've had moments where I doubt, can these things actually be real? I mean, is there any substance to them? Then I'll have confirmation, something will happen to remind me that yes, there are disembodied presences around us, some of the time.
Yeah, I know. I shouldn't be hitchhiking, especially these days with stranger danger and all that. Besides, who's going to pick me up here on one of the most haunted stretches of road in all the United States? Because this is the territory of the red-headed hitchhiker of Route 44. He's not a nice ghost. In fact, he doesn't even appear to be a ghost at all. He looks as solid as you or I, with his dirty jeans and his red flannel shirt, his long flowing hair and his big bushy red beard. He looks like any other resident of Rehoboth. <laughs> I love the moments of levity, your quirkiness. All those things are good because it, it, it keeps you moving on this emotional roller coaster, which all great stories have to, have to do. When you have that laughter, it humanizes the story for you, and it humanizes your experience of hearing that story. Think about some of the classic, you know, spinners of horror, like Alfred Hitchcock, the girls walking through the house, and everyone in the audience knows the killer's right behind the kitchen door, and she's getting closer to the kitchen door, and she's getting closer, and you're tense now, and you're scared, and then the phone rings, bring, and you jump, and you scream, and you laugh at yourself, because the woman picks up the phone, hello, yes, oh, yes, hi, yeah, no big deal, and then she puts the phone down, and you take a deep breath, and the killer jumps out. <laughs> and you're scared again, and it's that roller coaster that the masters know how to put you through. And that's, those moments of humor disarm you and make you relax, and can make the scary parts even scarier. He looks just like any other resident of Rehoboth. <laughs> that is until you get a little bit closer, and you look into his dark, soulless eyes. Travelers will be riding down Route 44 when they'll pass the Seekonk Rehoboth line, and there on the side of the road, they'll see this man. He'll be looking for a ride. They'll pull over, and he'll get into the back of the car, even if there's nobody else in the car except for the driver. They'll ask him where he's headed, but he won't say a word. He'll just keep staring at them with those empty eyes. As they ramble on down Route 44, the red-headed hitchhiker will begin to giggle. That giggle will soon turn into maniacal laughter, piercing the ears of everyone in the car until they just can't take it anymore. The driver will pull over and order the red-headed hitchhiker to exit the vehicle, but when he turns around and looks, the red-headed hitchhiker has vanished. So who is this red-headed hitchhiker? Was he someone who was in a car accident on that stretch of road or maybe clipped by a car as he walked down Route 44? Maybe he was somebody who lived in that location before there was even a road to travel down. But maybe the red-headed hitchhiker was never a person at all. Maybe he's just a reminder of what happens to us when we get into the car of a stranger. I think Frank's photography is extremely important uh, to this uh, performance because it helps take people right to the spot. I try to capture what's in that story. In other words, the ominous, gloomy, you don't know what's inside that house, you don't know what could be looming in that house type of effect. Frank has three-dimensional aspects and concepts. Frank brings you in to his photographs. When you're looking at a photograph by Frank Grace, after he's worked on it, after he's enhanced it, you're going into that setting. Oh. Thank you for joining me. I advise you bundle up against the evening chill as we enter this mostly rural section of Exeter, Rhode Island. And you see in back of us Chestnut Hill Cemetery. Well, maybe I shouldn't be here at night, but you're here as well. One thing you'll notice is a structure called a keep. Now there's a particularly dark and sinister story about this keep. Now there was a contagion that spread through New England back through the 19th century and we know that today as tuberculosis. It was then called consumption, meaning the wasting disease. And there wasn't a heck of a lot people could do about it back then except await the outcome, which was usually death, a wasting death. Well, this disease was dreaded as something supernatural. And I want to share the story of George and Mary Brown. Their family was struck by this wasting disease. The first one to contract the disease was the mother, 
Mary. She contracted the disease in 1883. This contagion eventually spread to Mercy Lena Brown, although she always preferred to be called Lena. And at age 19 years, Mercy died. Since this was January, she could not be buried in the soil. They had to await that spring thaw of two months later. So her body was laid inside the holding crypt. Now, it was whispered that some of this activity, some of this sickness, this rapid succession of deaths was caused by a vampire. So after Mercy Lena died, it was decided that action must be taken. A solution was sought and it wasn't found in a medical transcript or in an autopsy report, but from their graves, poor George Brown consented to have the bodies of his deceased loved ones disinterred. Now, as I mentioned, she had been laid in the holding crypt. The door was pried open, her grave box pulled out, and the lid pried off. Now, those who had not beforehand covered their mouths and noses wished they had, as a sickeningly sweet odor prevailed their nostrils. There, in the morning sunlight, was the lifeless form of Mercy Lena Brown. Lifeless? Well, her eyes were frozen open in a visionless stare. Her ruddy lips parted in the vague hint of a smile, and her fingers her slender fingers curled into claws. Perhaps most disturbing of all, her body had been turned to one side. This was their vampire. Therefore, Mercy Lena's heart was excised from her chest. And incredibly, fresh blood flowed from that organ. The heart was burned on the stone behind us and the ashes were mixed with oil and made into an elixir. Now this was supposed to provide an inoculation of sorts for brother Edwin, who had also been stricken with the dread disease and he might survive. Well, it was done, but that measure failed. Mercy Lena was buried in the soil. The deaths ceased. The reports of a vampire seemed to fade. Now, today we realize there are empirical causes for the remarkable condition in which Mercy Lena Brown's body was found. The chill preserved her body. Natural gases within bloated the corpse, rendering a lifelike appearance. It was even thought that perhaps she was put into her grave prematurely and tried to claw her way out. That would explain her fingers being curled into claws and the body being turned to one side. <laughs> when they moved her body, she emitted a groan. Well, that's not so unusual. But there is just enough of an element of the supernatural to make us pause and ponder. Was there a vampire in Exeter Cemetery? Now this would have been the end of the story were it not for the fact that this exhumation was notorious and became well publicized. Actually, newspaper clippings were found in the research papers of one author, an Irish author, named Bram Stoker. And he used the case of Mercy Lena Brown for his great novel published in 1897. That novel is titled Dracula. Oh, here comes a patrol car. I'll see you later. You share a ghost story because it's very much a bonding experience. If I tell you my personal experience, my personal ghost story, what I'm saying is I trust you. I'm saying I had this profound thing that I went through. I don't fully understand it, but I want you to believe me. I want you to know that this thing is real to me and I'm trusting you with this very precious thing. And there are these moments in these stories that if you have a heart, you're, you're going to feel something about these moments. The whole ghost story doesn't necessarily have to be a true one to be effectively scary, but it should have some basic 
veracity to it, something that's real. And some sense of the past, the history, the people involved, and someone seeing it in the present. Welcome to Moosa Valley, Rhode Island. This quaint little place can also be found on the National Register of Historic Places. The famous horror writer H.P. Lovecraft once spent some time here as an infant. He later referred to Moosa Valley and said, I haunted it in infancy. Apparently for some time now, people driving down Moosa Valley Road through the hamlet have seen a tired looking apparition standing in front of the Grange Hall with an old fashioned shovel over his shoulder. Back in the 1980s, the town had a local paper known as the Moosa Valley Moose. And a gentleman had sent a letter to the paper and said he wanted to get a strange story off of his chest. The man named Alfred apparently had lived in the area in the 1960s and he wanted to tell the readers of the paper about a strange and bizarre character he'd seen three times along the road late at night. He said that all these encounters took place in the autumn, right around 11.30 at night when he would drive through the area on his way home from work. He said the first time he saw this character, he, he passed over the, the bridge and was heading by the Tyler Cemetery when he noticed this tired middle-aged man in work clothes with an old-fashioned shovel over his shoulder. Alfred said he even noticed that the shovel had a chunk missing out of its blade. But even stranger, this man's eyes, these deep, dark, staring eyes, Alfred said that he felt like he had seen something he wasn't supposed to see, as, as if this was wrong somehow. Alfred said as he passed by the cemetery, he gave one last look over his shoulder and so the man and his shovel were nowhere to be seen. Alfred said he felt very, very uncomfortable about driving through the hamlet after that night. Intrigued by these stories, I started coming out here. A few years ago, I started doing vigils of my own in the autumn around the same time at night. On every night of my vigil while here, I heard what I can only describe from time to time, the sound of a metallic clang against the road surface. And it only happened when my back was to the road, never when I watched the road. Another time I was out here, I heard the definite sound of a peal of laughter coming from the Grange Hall. There were no cars around, there was no lights on in the hall, there was nobody there, but I heard that peal of laughter. As to whom the Grange Hall ghost was when he was alive, well, at the turn of the 20th century, some men here in town had found what they thought was a, a promising vein to a mother load of gold. They bought some property, set up a mining operation and all the money they could raise. And well, after a few years of backbreaking work, they barely found enough gold to pay back on their investments. The, the mine was a total failure. And when you think about man's lust for gold, well, that would explain the dirty work clothes, the broken shovel, and those deep, dark, staring eyes. I hope the audience took away the fact that not only did they see your performance, but they got to take away a piece of it and they get to share those stories with others. I think ghost stories are important because they are history and it's human history. They reflect who we are, they reflect our communities and, and so on, and they matter. They matter in a big way. They give us a glimpse at immortality, that the soul can go on. These were people and they, they felt and they cared and they loved and they had passions and they died. And sometimes they didn't die so well. And it just reminds you that history, you know, is, is created by people living and dying. The veil is growing thin, my friends. It is a time for ghost stories, just as it's been for thousands of years. It still is today. So why are these ghosts still here? In the Mexican tradition, they say we all die three deaths. The first death happens when your body expires. The second death 
That comes when they lay you into the ground. But the third and final death, that comes somewhere down the road. It happens when your name is uttered for the last time. And perhaps, perhaps that's why ghosts are still around us, because we won't allow them to leave. Death is truly the beginning. Well, death may be the beginning, but this is the end of our journey for tonight. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, we're all travelers to the grave. And if any of you should get there first, please wait and watch for us, won't you? Thank you, and good night.